Hi. Today we're going to bring, uh, bring our model of the atom up to speed with the modern day. Uh, as, a, as a way to get started, take a look at these problems. These are from previous lessons. Uh, hit the pause button if you need to. There's a link to your reference tables above my head. Um, but I'm going to get started. To write an, uh, an excited configuration for aluminum, we should first look up the ground state configuration of aluminum, which is 283. So what we're looking for is something that has 15, 13 electrons and uh, isn't 283. So that rules out C as a potential answer, and also B and D because that's the wrong total number of electrons, leaving us with A. For the second problem, as an electron moves uh, from ground state to excited state, the electron increases in energy. That's how that transition happens. Uh, that's kind of a definition thing. So for today, um, really, I want to talk about the Bohr model and its shortcomings. Turns out that the Bohr model is an excellent description for the hydrogen atom. Here's your 3 to 2 transition, your 4 to 2 transition, your 5 to 2 transition, and your 6 to 2 transition. And it's super clear that uh, these individual transitions release a discrete amount of energy, a thin quantized energy. And then when you start looking at things like uh, neon and ion, iron, there's way too many lines. There are too many lines for uh, a Bohr model to be good at really explaining what we're seeing. And these multi-electron systems can't be explained by the Bohr model of these discrete energy levels. So we have to say something more. Really what ends up happening is that electrons have this interaction with each other that impacts more than just repulsion and attraction. So to help explain this, I have a, a Dr. Quantum here who's going to explain a couple things uh, to all of us. And uh, let's get started. Take any notes. So, what they taught us in school isn't really the way it is. And that our senses are playing tricks on us. You just gotta wonder, what is this reality that we find ourselves in? Quantum physics says it's all just waves of information. Do I believe that? <laughs> I hope so. Yikes! And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. 
But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. Physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. Mostly because of that measuring device. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced so just to recap what, what was said and give a little bit more information, um, what we have here is an image of something we know that happens in the macroscopic world with waves. Waves being uh, a way of energy propagating through space. On the bottom, what we have is you're dropping two balls into water and they're making a bunch of waves as they bounce in the water. And you can see that the waves created from the two balls interact with each other uh, in, in the way that we're seeing in this animated GIF. The, uh, the top one is stationary, the bottom one is not. And when the peak, the top of one, aligns with the bottom of another, the, the overall resulting wave is flat. And you can see here these bands of no wave in between bands of very high wave. And you can see where the peak interacts with the peak. You get a doubly tall wave right here. And so when you have more than one wave, you do get this interference pattern of peaks and troughs of maxima, minima, zeros, and twos, essentially. Um, turns out that that's what waves do. So light would do that too. If you've ever played around with diffracting light through a prism, that's kind of how that works. But it also turns out that that's how particles work, as in subatomic particles, like electrons. When you get towards really small particles, the behavior between particle and wave, the differences start to blur. And it even ends up becoming a factor of whether or not you are observing it that changes how it behaves. And to really wrap our minds around this, the idea that an electron can go through two holes at the same time would really get at this idea of location being uncertain. So if you have um, a propeller that's not moving, I know that the propeller is, you know, a certain width and it exists in this, this place in space. If the propeller was moving though, I don't know where it is. So I could maybe take a picture of it, but when I take a picture, it's a blurry picture because as I take the picture, the propeller is moving through a certain amount of space. The propeller still has its width. Its width was only about that big. But the actual location now is unknown to me. All I know is that it exists somewhere in a certain range, but its exact position is uncertain. So to put these two thoughts together, the idea that uh, electrons will exist as particles because we see, you know, they get lost and gained in and out of atoms, they actually also exist as waves because when you try and measure them as waves, they end up proving that they're behaving that way. Um, a number of scientists got together and they were getting this new data as we got tools that allow, allowed us to observe electrons. And it turns out the, the real brief way to put this is that um, electrons, when they behave like waves, can be described with a mathematical formula. And that mathematical formula will actually spit out the energy and the location of the electron but when you do that, you don't get a firm picture of it existing 
in a shell around the nucleus. It's not just like it's an electron in there moving around in a circle. That doesn't work. Instead, what you get is a bunch of probable locations, a map of likely location of an electron called an orbital, not an orbit. Um, what you do is if you can integrate this over time, you get a, a decent picture of this is say like a 95% of the time where the electron probably is. You can't really stop the electron and say, where are you right now? That's not how the electrons work. Like you see in the video, um, once you put like, he put an eyeball, but be like you'd put a camera of some sort. If you put a camera there, the electron will start behaving like a particle. But as long as there is no observation taking place, it's just loosely associated with the entire region. The reason why the camera part matters is because the camera would, you know, interact with the electron by shining light on it to take a picture, and that's what ends up changing things. Um, but these clouds exist, and these electrons exist in these orbitals, and though the Bohr model, it's hard, though the Bohr model is technically not sufficient to explain a lot of what we see when we look to see how an electron behaves, it is sufficient to explain a lot of the macroscopic, pseudo-macroscopic atoms, molecules, ions, and bonding. So moving forward, we're probably going to use mostly the Bohr model, but we will still talk about some of this uh, from time to time. Thanks for watching.